I want to welcome you to SciCom 2020. My name is Dr. Eileen Hebbitz, and I am a professor in the School of Biological Sciences here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And it is so great to have all of you joining us um, for what's already turning out to be a fun, engaging, and informative conference. Next up is our first keynote speaker who will be introduced by Jocelyn Boss. Thank you so much, Eileen, and thank you to all of you. I'm so excited that you could join us here for this No Coast SciComm conference. Uh, the name, by the way, is inspired by our own uh, roller derby team here in Lincoln, the No Coast Derby Girls. So we thought we'd take on that mantle for, for our conference as well. Um, but I'm, I'm really thrilled to welcome her tonight. And I want to tell you just a little bit about our first keynote speaker. I don't want to take up too much time telling you about all of her amazing work, because I think she can do a better job of that herself. Um, but her name is Raven Baxter. You may know her as Raven the Science Maven. She's a science communicator and a molecular biologist who works to progress the state of science culture by creating spaces that are inclusive, educational, and real. Raven is known for her unique style of combining science, music, and cultural awareness as an entertaining content creator and musician. So when I first saw her video, Wipe It Down, uh, which many of you have probably also seen, she very quickly became one of my favorite science communicators. And I must tell you that after the first conversation that we had, she also immediately became one of my favorite people. And I know she will quickly become one of your favorite people too. Um, she creates STEM-themed music that teaches and empowers both students and professionals in STEM and beyond. She speaks internationally to students, educators, and leaders about the importance of STEM diversity and innovation in science education. She is the founder of STEMBACY, a science advocacy organization that embraces a diverse and accomplished membership of scientists, engineers, and tech professionals that serve as leaders to the next generation of STEM. And so I'm going to turn it over to Raven and welcome Raven the Science Maven to get this party started and kick off No Coast SciComm. Hi everybody. <laughs> um, I hope everybody's doing well today. I am so excited to be here. Thank you to the University of Nebraska Lincoln for having me. It's certainly a pleasure to open for this very important conference where science communicators from around the world, thank you to the pandemic, uh, are able to come and uh, communicate with one another and share ideas and um, also uh, learn from one another. So um, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. I had something planned for us where I actually wanted to have everybody basically break <laughs> two of the most important rules for Zoom meetings, right? And that first rule is uh, unmute yourselves, right? Don't do that, right? I don't think we've quite figured out the logistics for it, but that's okay. In theory, think about this in theory, I wanted everyone to unmute themselves. And then I wanted everyone to scream, scream as loud as you can into your microphone, right? And uh, I actually kind of wonder as a scientist, would that have crashed the system if everybody <laughs> unmuted at the same time and screamed? But um, nevertheless, um, even though we can't do that, we can imagine that I asked you to do that and that we could do it. And think about how that makes you feel. Would you actually be comfortable screaming into your microphone on your computer? Um, I know some of you probably would be a little apprehensive about doing that, right? It's a little weird. It's not just weird because you're probably at home in a room by yourself. Why are you screaming? I don't know. Or maybe you're in a room full of people. Maybe you're in the lab and there's people in the lab doing work. Why are you screaming? But um, if you were all alone, with no care in the world, how would you use your voice? Um, and that's really gonna be the center of my talk today is how to find your voice as a science communicator. Um, I'm gonna start by telling you guys how I found my voice as a science communicator. And then I want to engage in a discussion about how you're gonna find your voice or learn more about how you found your voice if you, if you feel really confident and comfortable with your voice as a science communicator. So I'm gonna get started. Um, I think that most of us here, you know, if you're, if you're here and you don't like science, I'm not sure what, how you got here, but thanks for coming. Otherwise, I'm sure if you're hearing my voice right now, you can probably say that you absolutely love science, right? And 
I think that I'm probably not unique in my story in that I have loved science I mean, from a point in time that I can't even remember. I, I actually left a joke and say that I popped out of the womb, you know, my precious mother's womb with a test tube in my hand and like Eppendorf tubes and a pipetter. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's, that's how I feel. I feel like I truly was born to be a scientist. Um, so think about your history as a scientist or a science enthusiast and um, how deep in your life that reaches for you. For me, it was in early childhood. And um, I was a very inquisitive child. I, I actually happened to be an only child growing up. Um, and I also had ADHD, so I was very hyperactive. I was inquisitive, I was curious. I didn't have any siblings to waste my time. <laughs> so I um, ended up getting into a lot of exploration on my own and um, looking at the world around me just out of, based on my own curiosity. And I would really irritate my mother because I would be mixing things around the house that really should not have been mixed together, like nail polish with honey, with baby powder, with the remote control, <laughs> you know, just, just to see what would happen. And um, I was really, early on just experimenting with the world around me. And of course, um, that irritated my mother because I was getting into trouble. But she took that interest, she took that curiosity and decided to put me into constructive science learning opportunities, such as Girl Scouts, such as eventually Space Camp. Um, my mother actually uh, f forwarded me in a text message a picture of me at space camp today, which was really interesting. And um, I was in the newspaper for it, which was really cool. Um, but I ended up going to space camp and I loved space camp. And they actually were in danger of shutting down because of the pandemic and um, due to the generous donations uh, from their supporters, they're able to stay open, which I'm really glad that they were able to do that. But um, I was able to attend as a young child, I believe in the sixth grade. And it was one of the most transformative experiences of my life because at that time I wanted to be an astronaut, right? And, um, but at space camp, they didn't just teach you about being an astronaut. They taught you about all the different careers that it takes to get somebody into space. So to get someone into space, there must be physicists, astronomers, geologists, um, chemists, biologists, and also communications people, right? Um, people in tech, people in computer, si computer science. So there were all types of careers uh, that were spoken about at Space Camp. And that was great because I ultimately found out <laughs> that I was afraid of heights <laughs> at Space Camp. Uh, yes, I'm going to repeat that. I found out at Space Camp that I was afraid of heights. So therefore, as you can assume, my career as an astronaut <laughs> completely went away, it's gone. Um, but the fortunate thing about that was I had knowledge then at a, at a young age about all of the different types of uh, STEM careers that exist. Again, geology, chemistry, physicists, astronomy, the world was my oyster. So. Um, from that point forward, my love for science grew as I went to explore all of those different fields, and I eventually graduated with a bachelor's and master's degree in biology. Um, and as Jocelyn mentioned, my specific field of um, interest is in molecular biology. And um, for those of you who aren't really sure what that is, Essentially, I am interested in understanding how molecules work together to generate life processes in various organisms, so, um, or in cells. Um, so that's my specialty. And I, um, I had a really great experience as a student. And I graduated with my master's degree on a Saturday and started my career as a molecular scientist on uh, that actual very, next Monday. Uh, that's how excited I was to become a scientist. And so my first job out of grad school was at a corporate molecular science lab. And again, guys, I was so excited to be a scientist, to do science. Remember, like I've been chasing science since I came out the womb, basically. And um, it was finally 
my chance to get paid to do exactly what I had loved to do my entire life. Um, my job title was scientist, and like I was, I was, I was there. I made it. I did it right. Um, so you can imagine my excitement on my first day of work as I'm starting my my position. And um, so you know, this is this is when my experience as a scientist kind of started shifting. And um, these next few things that I'm going to tell you guys about is is really what um, shaped my perspective as a science communicator and impacted my style uh, by which I communicate science today. Um, so I was working, I was working, I was doing my best, doing the science that I love to do, and um, I started to notice something, you know, something wasn't quite right. Again, I had really great experiences as a student. Um, however, when I got to the workplace, um, I noticed that I wasn't really socializing this in the same way. And um, I was feeling a little lonely. And, you know, you can kind of think about a time where you look around you and maybe you're in a room full of people and perhaps no one is quite talking to you and you feel left out. Um, that was what was happening to me. So as I was doing my experiments, I would be in the lab and um, you know, my coworkers would engage in small talk. They would be asking about, oh, how was your day? How are your kids? Um, you know, let's do something after work. Let's hang out. What are you interested in? What are your hobbies? Like really forming those bonds and connections that um, happen naturally, you know, when, when you open up to other people around you. But I was, I was not a part of that. And um, it made me feel very unincluded right there was a huge lack of inclusivity in that workplace and um what i also began to notice over time you know it wasn't something that was initially apparent to me until i started having these feelings of loneliness what i eventually realized was that i was actually the only person who looked like me in the entire lab and um but you know nevertheless i continued to do the work because i loved i loved science and um I had the opportunity to work on a variety of projects from drug discovery, you know, um, and virology, microbiology, cell culture, protein purification, um, crystallization. I was doing it all. So I was, I was really enjoying the technical aspect, but the social aspect was really hard. And um, one day I noticed that my job actually did hire somebody else who looked like me and it happened to be the lab custodian. And one of my coworkers um, turned to me and they said, you're, you should be happy that you're not the only token or that you're not the token black person anymore. And um, that really like, it crushed me. And you can think about how hard I had worked to earn that position, I earned it. Uh, I was qualified for the position, but yet I had, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't included. Um, no one was quite socializing with me. And then to find out that not only was that happening, but that other people were not seeing me as equal. Um, and that really confirmed one of my worst fears was that although, you know, I felt like a scientist and that I was doing science, that other people were, were not seeing me as one and the same, even though I was. So um, that, that really shifted my perspective a little bit on science and what it meant to be a scientist um, and be a scientist and do science. And I identified that I was being put into a box of what people believe that scientists do what they look like or where people like me belong whether they belong in science or not whether their presence in science is a token or not there was an actual box that people were putting me in um and so small small little microaggressions little things kept happening over time and um i ultimately decided that i wanted to try something different um i ended up going to academia and teaching at a college because i had I wanted to, um, I felt like being in academia was a safer place for me because I really enjoyed being a student. I love teaching just as much as I love learning science. And um, actually, 
switching to uh, science education was probably one of the coolest things that I've ever done with my career path because I was able to be more creative. Um, I did a lot of fun things in my classrooms. Um, if you guys follow me and the work that I do in my SciComm, I make a lot of music. I, I do music videos. I'm very creative in the way that I express myself. And um, in the classes that I teach, I allow my students to express that same level of creativity, even if it's a genetics class. Um, I would let students write uh, plays about genetics, uh, spoken word, poetry jams about genetics and rap songs about genetics, movies, we would do, we would do anything. Um, so that was a very rewarding experience that also, that also impacted my SciComm career. But let me tell you what happened um, on my first day of work in that position. Um, on my first day of work as a college instructor, one of my coworkers actually threatened to call the police on me. And it was because I couldn't find my mailbox in the faculty mailroom. And that's, that's literally it. <laughs> um, and I laugh, I laugh about these things now because I, I've definitely healed, right? It was definitely traumatic when this happened to me, but I've, I'm so fortunate to be in a place where I can laugh and I've learned and grown from it. Um, but I was trying to, it was my first day of work. I was trying to find my mailbox. It, no one had shown it to me before. Um, this person, when my coworker physically blocked me from getting into the mail room um, and then eventually let me into the mail room that I belonged in, right? And then as I was searching for my mailbox, continued to interrogate me, you know, where's your office? I'm like, I don't know. It's my first day, I don't know. Um, and then they asked for my identification, which I showed. It was my faculty ID with my picture, with the school name on it, with the, my department, my position title. Um, and it also gave me access to the printer in the room. So I, I scanned my card into the printer and I said, see, you know, here's my card. It's scanned to the printer, which means that it's, you know, it's a card. I belong here. And they didn't believe me. They actually didn't believe that it was real, they said my card was fake, and as a result, they decided that they wanted to call the police and that I should be arrested. Ugh, frustrating. And so ultimately, um, in our conversation, what was said was that my coworker didn't think that I looked like I belonged in the department. And um, that was their rationale for wanting to have me you know, approached by police. So, you know, at this point, I was, I was really frustrated because I, you know, I had noticed a pattern and a pattern of people around me in science, right, who are putting me into boxes that I didn't necessarily feel like I belonged in, right? Um, people who were forcing upon me what their idea of a scientist is. Um, and what, what scientists look like, what they do, how they dress, act, talk, speak, all of that, um, all of those things were being forced upon me, other people's ideas of, of who I should be and what my place in science was. And um, it was very frustrating to me because as I shared with you all before, I've, I was very confident in, in that I belonged in science and that I had a place in science and that I could do science and I shouldn't really be questioned, uh, you know, because I, I, my philosophy is always that if you love science, if you want to do science, then you belong in science. And that's it. Um, so I took some moments of reflection to really think about what was happening and the trends and the patterns I was seeing. And I, I started to conduct research. And around this time, I started a PhD in science education on uh, what do people perceive uh, as a scientist in America? What are some of the most popular images of scientists in America? And um, as I was conducting this research and asking these questions, I found that there's, there's almost a 50 year history of other scientists before me asking these same questions. And what I found was that historically, I'm, I'm sure that you guys won't be surprised, but Historically, in the media, 
particularly, scientists have been portrayed as people who don't even look anything like me. Um, usually they're portrayed as white men. And um, what I also found in my research was that we know that the media has some major impacts on how people perceive the world around them. So images that are portrayed in the media can often have impacts on how we as humans understand and view society and the world around us. So, um, you know, making all of these connections, there's really no surprise as to why when I would walk into a room that someone might be like, hmm, I've never quite seen anybody who looks like her in this position. There's something wrong about this. Maybe I should question it. And I'm not saying that is the right thing to do, but there is, what I'm saying is that there is a reason for everything. So once I discovered that this pattern had been occurring throughout, you know, decades and decades and decades of, of um, research, I set out to do something, right? Because I noticed that this, this was a problem because, um, I, people were putting me into this box of what they believed a scientist looked like, and it was making me uncomfortable. I felt like I needed to do something. And so my mission at that point became, um, at, at the time, I didn't know that this is what I was doing, but I was becoming a science communicator at that point in time because I made it my mission to um, redefine what the image of a scientist is, in America at least. And I wanted to make a statement to the world that anybody can do science, literally anybody, meaning big, small, large, tiny, you know, brown, purple, pink, blue, black, white, orange, you know, man, woman, any gender, anybody can do science and be a scientist. And um, so what I ended up doing was I created a music video and my music video is titled big old geeks and before i show it to you guys i'm going to show you a little clip i just want to say that it really is um my response to how i felt about being put in a box and um it's definitely a visual overload for some so i'm gonna i'm gonna show it to you guys and then i'm gonna talk about it a little bit so let's Let's see, here we go. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. I'm gonna play a few seconds of this. Cut it, run it, cut it. Run we some big old, big old, big old geeks. We some big old geeks, but the tennis place up. You Vander Walls, I'm ionic. Scientists twerking, iconic. I'm doing both, I'm bionic. Look if you buck periodically. Okay. Acting like an enzyme and we cutting it up. Proteins in the gel and we running them up. I'm a chocolate girl, skin Reese's Pieces I run this thing like electrophoresis You mess with me, your knowledge increases I'm legit, look me up, read my thesis I'm repping Okay, so that is That is Big Ol' Geeks And that video, you know, there's there's a lot going on in there It's It's definitely a visual overload But I did that intentionally, right? Um so let's talk about the process of me. This is my pretty much my first or um, one of my early ventures out into the world as a science communicator. And um, what was important to me was that as I formed my identity as a science communicator, I really wanted to be my unapologetic self. It was so important to me that I shatter literally every box that I felt I was being confined to by by science culture, to be honest, and, and that includes, you know, people that I've worked with, um, people that I've had positive encounters with, negative encounters with in the science space. I, I truly felt that I, I needed to use my voice um, as a scientist to express my space that I would like to occupy as a scientist and, and who I am, right? So um, in making that video, it actually was one of the hardest hardest things that I've ever had to do. Um, and it was hard because not only was I breaking out of boxes that other people put me in, but as I, as we were filming that, I realized that I had put myself into these mental spaces, these boxes of what I thought that a scientist should 
do or how we should communicate or behave or act or how we should creatively express ourselves, what we wear, how we talk. Um, and, you know, all of these things that are personal to me, I had never quite expressed in the science space. And I honestly don't know if I really ever had the space to do that, right? I had to make that space for myself and that was very uncomfortable. But I, I still followed through with it because I really felt in my core that um, people would benefit from seeing a scientist who was not going to follow along with the status quo um, and see people in science who are maybe just liberating themselves from, from these boxes and doing things just a little bit different. And I was really hoping to relate to people um, who maybe were commonly left out of mainstream, uh, mainstream outreach efforts, you know, in terms of communicating science. And uh, when I put the video out, I actually wasn't sure if it was going to be the beginning of my career or like the end of my career, right? Because they, there's nothing else that exists like that on the internet. Um, there, there's really no black women in science who have communicated science in that way unapologetically embracing rap culture. You guys saw club wear, you guys saw fast cars, you, but you also saw me in the lab. You also saw me having fun in the lab. And um, all of the lyrics that you just heard were intentionally incredibly scientific. Um, so embracing all of those things, um, combining my love for rap music, my love of myself and being myself and my unapologetic self along with my science competency was something that I had never seen before. And um, so ultimately I ended up studying the impact of my music video um, in my doctoral research. And I <clears throat> actually studied the responses of 50 black women I interviewed and collected survey data from. Um, 50 black women, 25 of which have STEM careers and the other 25 do not have STEM careers. They have careers in fields other than STEM. And across the board, um, they, they ultimately felt like the video that I made and the way that I communicated science resonated with them in a way that they have never been taught before. Um, for women who were in STEM careers, they actually felt that the representation that was provided in, in the music video and what was communicated in the music, music video was not only educational, but it also motivated them to work harder in their fields and to um, stay strong, to persevere, um, because STEM can unfortunately not be very diverse, which can have some impacts, both, you know, negatively on marginalized folks. But seeing representations such as uh, the kind in the music video that I created really encouraged uh, women who were in STEM careers to continue on and do the work and they felt supported and they felt like they had a place, they were included. And um, that, that was very affirming to me. And um, I also learned that, you know, continuing to be my unapologetic self could um, carry on positive impacts to, on the STEM community. Now for the people who did not have STEM careers in my study, um, the, those messages were really the same. Those people, even though they didn't have STEM careers, being able to see a marginalized person in a field where you know, they're underrepresented, actually have fun and be able to be themselves and escape these boxes that people are commonly placed in as, as marginalized folks um, was empowering to also folks who are not in STEM careers. And not only that, but for the 25, um, half of my participants uh, that did not have STEM careers, almost 80% of the people who did not have STEM careers said that they at least would have tried to pursue a STEM career if they had that type of representation earlier in their lives. Um, and so, you know, innovating your style of science communication, breaking out of these boxes that um, you might exist in as, as a person, as a professional, as a scientist, you know, we occupy all, we occupy all of these different spaces. Um, breaking out of those boxes can really have major impacts, not only on the science community, STEM community, 
but also uh, on the general population. So what I really want to leave you all with today before we go into the Q&A session is I, I want you to think about how are you going to be your unapologetic self as a science communicator? Recently, um, I saw on Twitter that there are some people, you know, I, I'm on Twitter, I browse, I'm on Twitter. I know some of you probably know me from Twitter, <laughs> um, but I, I like to read what other people are talking about a lot of the time. And I see some people really struggling with their SciComm career, their science communication career. And um, some of the concerns that I'm seeing are some people are, I'm afraid that some people are really working to define um, themselves in a way that's not really true to them. And putting pressure on themselves to communicate science in the way that it's been traditionally communicated. And that can be stressful if that doesn't come naturally to you. Um, so I want you to think about what does come naturally to you. What are you passionate about? What, what makes you cry, right? What makes you angry? What makes you happy? What makes you proud? What do you bring to the table? You know, all of these things are, are your values. Um, what, think about what boxes you might exist in that you, that you perceive other people are placing you in, but then maybe even do some deeper introspective work and ask, what mental confines do I have in my head that are preventing me from truly expressing who I really am? Um, and, and how am I going to understand what that means for me and use my voice as a science communicator um, to, to mirror who I am as a person? Um, so I, I definitely would like for you all to think about that today. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that it's, it's really important that we also recognize that science is not just about the technical uh, aspect of, of what we do, right? It's, it's very great that we as science communicators can rattle off 10 facts about the digestive system and then, you know, on Monday and then on Tuesday, we can tell you 20 facts about diabetes. And then on Wednesday, we can tell you about everything about Pluto and if it's a planet or not. And um, that is amazing. But I also think that now more than ever, especially in these, in these days, right, in the days that are coming, it's, it's so important that we not only focus on the science, but also the communication aspect. And um, a part of communicating is making sure that you are involved in the communities. Um, I want to shout out all of the people who are using their voice or have found their voice in the past few months. I'm sure that if, if you're active on social media, you're seeing a lot of scientists who are banding together and forming their circles, right? Um, and, and really recognizing the importance of talking to each other, forming communities, supporting each other, and amplifying um, each other's voices. So um, thank you to everyone uh, who's here tonight. Uh, don't, don't forget to do that introspective work and uh, working on your voice as a science communicator and being true to yourself. Um, and I do want to add that, you know, being true to yourself is not, it doesn't look the same for everyone. So for me, um, I like to do rap music. I do rap music videos. I like to, you know, I'm out here, I do different things. But for you, it might just be when you go to the lab, you know, if you so choose to wear makeup, maybe you put on that eyeliner that you were afraid to put on because you were afraid of what everybody would think about a scientist with eyeliner, right? Or maybe it's you put on a dress one day or you wear that cool tie, you know, instead of that boring tie that you usually wear. Or maybe you speak up for yourself in a time where you normally wouldn't have in the past and start using your voice that way. Um, think about what using your voice looks like for you. Um, and and do that be your unapologetic self and maybe if you're like me you'll tell the world that you're a big old geek so that's it thank you so much raven you know i have to tell you that people were um screaming with you in the q a box earlier and they were screaming in their hearts and i know that even though you can't hear us all now they are clapping for you and cheering for you and they certainly have been doing so in the q a box all along so um oh.
I love your final message. And it's something that we talked about, Raven, when we when we first chatted. And, and I told you the story of how at the very first SciComm back in 2015, I gave a talk that was ostensibly about science slams as a form of science communication. But about a third <laughs> of it ended up being devoted to advocating um, more use of exclamation points in professional emails, or at least not letting yourself be shamed out of using exclamation <laughs> points in professional emails. And you told me that the very first tweet that you ever put out there um, it was in all caps and that somebody <laughs> got on and retweeted it and said, the first rule of SciComm, never tweet in all caps. But I think what we can take away from your talk is that the first rule of SciComm is that there are no rules of SciComm. Exactly, yes. If, if the first yes. rule of SciComm was not to talk about SciComm, that wouldn't make any sense, especially since we're having a conference here. But the first rule <laughs> of SciComm is definitely that there are no rules of SciComm. So we've had some questions come in already in the Q&A and they're piling up as we speak. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of filter through them. Um, okay. We have 10 minutes for questions. A couple of them had to do with the kinds of creative assignments that you do in class. So. Mackenzie asked, when you're doing creative assignments in class, like music videos, plays, etc., do you ever get pushback from students? And if so, how do you include students who don't feel their creativity matches what you were asking them to do? Um, and then um, John wondered, when you incorporate these kinds of creative media-driven assignments into your classes, how are they assessed and graded? How do you solve the technical challenges? So a couple of questions there about those creative assignments you have your classes do. Yes, great questions. So um, the creative assignments I have always done as group assignments and um, I'm really fortunate to have taught in very diverse classrooms where it's, it's a spectrum in age. Like I've had classrooms where I've had grandmothers in working in group projects with recent high school graduates and people across the spectrum of, of gender and ethnicity and age. And it's, it's really been a beautiful thing to watch people group together in those um, diverse settings and do something creative because you get to see all of these different types of things come out. And um, I personally, as an instructor, have not struggled with getting my students to be creative. And I think maybe a part of that is not giving them too many rules on what they can do. Um, I, all I really ask is that they make an original project and not anything that I can find on the internet or, you know, nothing that that's obviously plagiarism is a huge no, you know, don't plagiarize someone's creative project that already exists. Um, and once they realize, oh, I can do anything, you know, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, do anything. Um, then it's really hard to kind of, <laughs> you know, go wrong there. And then as far as the assessment piece goes, I usually pair my creative assignments with a test, like an actual um, formal exam. But, um, and I personally, I mean, I, I could talk all day about exams and how I feel about them. Um, right now, I feel like there's still an okay way of measuring student outcomes, but, um, I also find that my students have less anxiety taking exams and doing test taking when I pair it with a creative assignment. Um, and I kind of let them uh, cushion each other a little bit, you know. Um, but these are great questions, thank you. Awesome, okay. So staying a little bit within the same theme, but more uh, sort of focusing on how, how you navigate um, these sort of two cultures as we tend to think of them, science on the one hand and the arts and humanities on the other. Um, Mark Riley from UNL says, uh, love, love, love your message. You're describing something that is really hard. A lot of science involves following rules like an experimental protocol, but the most amazing things happen when people work outside those rules. So how do you find ways to walk both sides of this equation at the same time? Time. Um, wow, that's a really uh, deep question. So I I think Mark, Mark's been deep here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so thanks, Mark. Um, the best way I can answer this off the top of my head is when you see a need for something, um, I feel like you kind of follow the rules up until a certain point where you have to address the need, right? So in what I've done, like let's take my video for example, I followed the rules my whole life, you know, as you know, science, you know, being a straight, straight edge, you know, doing it by the rules, you know, not being, not shaking it up, not ruffling feathers, just doing my thing, right? And, but then I saw a need, I saw a need for me to not do that. And that's when I just abandoned 
almost all of the rules. Um, my, my thing is as long as you're respecting people and you're not harming people, um, then, you know, you can pretty much just be assured that you're doing something okay, right? Hopefully that answered your question. That's what's helped me stay in line. That's great. So yeah, speaking of, of respect and, and not wanting to harm anybody, kind of reflecting on some of the experiences that you've had, Carol from Nebraska EPSCoR, hi Carol, uh, asks on a scale of one to 10 with your onboarding story described being a negative 10, what have you seen uh, more in the positive direction for inclusivity and broadening participation in STEM, apart from your own work, obviously? Um, we'd love to hear an example or two from you. Thanks for your perspective and love your video. So have you seen, have you seen progress? Have you seen a few examples of, of good things happening in terms of, of increasing inclusivity and broadening participation in STEM? Yes, absolutely. And I want to say that one of the most profound examples um, I actually, I can't get too specific because I'm still working out the details of this particular opportunity, but um, someone approached me recently with an opportunity and they were very transparent about their need for diversity. Um, and, and the executive director of this institution um, was, was very transparent. They were like, you know what, we're trying our best. You know, we wanna make a diverse, inclusive environment she just straight up was like, we need a black woman in here, you know? And, and I was like, I'm not mad at that, you know? As I would rather you tell me up front that, you're, that you have done your research and that you're working hard to create diverse and inclusive spaces and that you, that you understand that I have something to bring to the table and that you value that and that you, you actually see me, you know, as a black woman and you want me in your space. You know, not, not simply because I'm a black woman and you're trying to add diversity, but because you also see my talents and value my talents. And that, that was a level of transparency that I really needed to see, you know, especially in these times where I feel like everybody is trying to really like get up to speed with their um, a, a plus diversity and inclusion initiatives, which is awesome. But seeing a level of, um, genuine attitudes and uh, transparency and authenticity behind it really was refreshing to me. Um, and I think it, that just comes from having leadership that is socially aware and culturally aware and, and putting that into action. So yeah, I, you know, but that was very recent. <laughs> um, and I'm looking forward to seeing more progress. Yeah. Yeah, staying on that theme also, um, Alexandra is wondering, she is a female sh shark scientist having a major issue, I've been reading about this, with the lack of representation in the media for Shark Week. Um, do you have any practical suggestions for how we can begin to encourage, encourage media outlets to feature women and people of color? Uh, it seems like, ironically, we have to rely on the white male scientists who are senior researchers to lead this change because they have the most clout and often many followers, even though there are many science communicators of different backgrounds who may have a smaller following, trying to make names for themselves and calling for change from outlets like the Discovery Channel. And then uh, sort of in a different but related direction, um, someone is wondering, what are your best tips to gain a following for ourselves as beginning science communicators? So. Um, First, what are your tips for um, encouraging media outlets to feature more women and people of color, sort of practical approaches? And, and second, if you are one of, one of those who may or may not fall into a, an underrepresented group, but who's a beginning science communicator, how do you gain a following? Okay, um, <laughs> so two, two parts to this question, right? Um, so I personally, you know, I'm a very, as you guys can tell, I'm like a super bubbly person, like, you know, very positive and whatever. But I really have no problem calling out people on their stuff, right? Because if you don't do that, then nobody's going to know that there's something wrong. There's, nobody's going to know that there's something to fix, right? And everybody's just going to keep going like about their day, thinking everything's okay and they're doing everything right and nobody's saying anything. So, you know, even though I'm this super positive, bubbly person, like, I will be the first person on Twitter <laughs> to be like, no, this was, this was wrong. This was wrong. <laughs> we got to fix this. Let's get some solutions here. Let's talk about that because that's what we have to do. So um, as far as, like, we're talking about the Discovery Channel, for example. Discovery Channel, if you happen to watch this, okay, you're just an example, but, okay, obviously we have something to talk about here. Um, but... 
tag the Discovery Channel. Let's have a conversation with the Discovery Channel on a public platform such as Twitter, you know, all of these social media channels. Let's have a real and authentic conversation because we're all science communicators. They, they need us, right, to run, to actually run their network. They need science communicators. They should be listening to the conversations that we're having about their programming and the needs that, that we are identifying um, through consuming their media. And it also helps, you know, to bring in actual data from studies. There's decades of research conducted on, um, you know, diversity in the media. The Gina Davis Institute actually did a really, they do a lot of um, gender research studies that have really, really telling findings on the work that needs to be done. Um, so if, if you speak it into existence, I believe it will happen. Um, as far as, um, I, as far as creating your following um, as a science communicator, um, you know what? I would say that it will come naturally, um, but you should always just be yourself. I, I personally have never set out on this journey with the intention of, oh my God, I'm gonna have all of these followings. I'm gonna be giving a keynote at University of Nebraska Lincoln, SciComm, Con, like, I, I never would have imagined this for myself and all of this was possible simply because I used my voice and I was just being myself. And, um, you know, a lot of people seem to have resonated with that. And I, I honestly don't think that there's a particular formula for, you know, success or whatever you deem as success or um, gaining momentum as a science communicator. All I can say is if you choose to be a science communicator, do it authentically and as yourself. Of course, it helps if yourself is awesome, like Raven's self. It does. <laughs> but, you know, I already know that all of you are awesome, too, because you're attending this conference and you wouldn't be here if you weren't awesome. So being yourself is good advice in that sort of situation. A few other things. Let me see where there was an important one here. Um, we... Oh, this is, a, this is a big one that I think everybody can sort of relate to and, and, and maybe is concerned about if they're, if, especially if they're starting out in science communication. How do you keep yourself from delving in too deep when you're talking about science that you're passionate about? So I imagine this means, how do you keep yourself from, uh, from, from going off and, and, and speaking at too, too high a level or getting into too much detail for your audience? Okay. Well, as a molecular biologist, um, I already feel like... <laughs> Most of the things I talk about, you know, when I, when I choose to talk about molecular bio, I really like, okay, you know, we're phosphorylating what protein, you know, and the people are like, what? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that it's, it's really good to remember your audience, first of all, right? So I was asked the other day, um, how do you determine how to communicate your science to different people? And in the back of my head, my first question is, who am I trying to communicate with, right? Um, I've actually had the privilege of teaching in classrooms all, like every grade from kindergarten to of senior years in college, like college seniors, um, even pre-K. So, and I've had to teach science in each one of those classrooms. And what I actually learned um, in my experience is that teaching science to kids like elementary, middle school kids is actually kind of the same as teaching science to adults who are not in science. So um, that kind of goes to show in my science communication, a lot of the time when I make things for adults, they actually resonate with kids as well. <laughs> like the big old geeks music video um, and the COVID-19 video, Wipe It Down I did, were actually for adults. Like I, I was not making that stuff like, oh, these kids are gonna love this. Kids are gonna be in the bubble bath, doing the thing, wiping it down, you know. That was not, that was not going through my head, but it resonated with kids as well. So um, that's one piece of advice, you know, don't get too worked up over that. Um, and then otherwise, I guess if you're talking to scientists about science, it's kind of fun to figure out where, where the road stops, right? Like if I'm talking to an ecologist about evolution and you know, I'm thinking about protein evolution in my head and they're thinking about organismal evolution, we can, we can kind of meet at a certain point, but then there's a point where we can't really, you know, we're speaking two different languages. So um, yeah, just know your audience, basically. 
Okay, so, fantastic. And that I think leads very well into what will sadly be our last question. And there are more questions in the Q&A, but here's what I can say. Follow Raven on Twitter. So at Raven Simaven, yes? Yes. Yes, okay, good, yes. Um, and, and for those who are, are beginning science communicators who are, are looking to gain a following or are looking to draw attention to an issue like the lack of representation in Shark Week, for example, tag Raven in it too, because then if she retweets it, like this is what happened with this conference. I'm not kidding you. Like, I don't know how many registrants we had, but then once we confirmed that Raven was gonna be a keynote, and she tweeted about it. The next day we had 5 million people registered. I'm not kidding, give or take a few. Um, and so, uh, so if, if you happen to have a connection with somebody who's awesome like Raven and has a following, then you know, I know Raven is very supportive and helpful for science communicators who are getting started. So that's another strategy. Um, and so for our final talk, uh, how are you approaching the increasing uh, skepticism towards science these days, Raven? This comes from an anonymous attendee, by the way, especially with your experience being an unexpected face of science and catering to people across the age spectrum. And you did oh. a video called Wipe It Down. Um, you know, what, what, what's your advice or how are you approaching this sort of current cultural climate towards science? You know what? I think that this kind of goes along with the overall messaging of tonight. And I think that we have to just get comfortable with communicating our science and get more crafty with it, right? I almost feel like we as science communicators now more than ever have a true responsibility to actually serve, like provide a service and serve our country with information. Accurate, correct information, facts, right? Um, and also, we have a duty to be approachable. It's, it, I think that as a science communicator, we're doing a disservice to the world if we know all these things and we know how to access facts and, and information, and, but we're not approachable. We're not in our communities communicating the information in a way that they can understand. We're not you know, reaching our hand across the table and maybe starting conversations pleasantly, you know, not trying to start a, a science fight, which I know science Twitter be popping sometimes, but you know, reaching our hand across the table and just saying, hey, you know, I just want to know what you think about this. Can we have a chat about it, you know, and it not be like something that blows up out of proportion. Let's just kind of, you know, just talk about it. And um, we're, we're really missing the whole human aspect of science and the fact that, you know, all humans want to have relationships. We're not really solitary individuals. We prefer to socialize. And so I, I think we need to get more comfortable um, putting ourselves out there right now is now is really the time to perfect your skills as a science communicator um, and as a communicator in general because we have a lot of healing to do here in our country a lot of bridges to build right and a lot of things to teach so um, with that like I hope that you guys really take advantage of these awesome workshops here <laughs> in the conference and and really take it seriously and kind of come out with a sense of duty and responsibility to to um, kind of fix some of this um, this disconnect with science that we're experiencing right now in, in, a, in our society. I can't think of a better way to end the beginning than that. <laughs> so thank you so much, Raven. Thank you, and I just wanna say thank you to everyone who supports me um, in my endeavors. Thank you to everyone who's joined my Patreon. Um, thank you to everyone who's retweeted my stuff and um, amplified my voice these past few months. And I, I really mean it, like it's definitely changed my entire life just having your support and um, everybody behind me kind of just believing in me and like pushing me to do my thing. So thank you. And thank you for having me, everyone. It's really been a pleasure tonight.